Well, but, that's give me the map. What you just told yeah. me about Lear and give me the map. Let's see where we go. And Langham, and so Hirsch did that. And he said, he's not ready. Go see Michael. Fix, 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 fix. And Langham said, I can't burden him with too many other things. You know, he could be a baroon in time, but I got Joe Ziegler. He'll be brilliant for that. I don't need him to do that. I need him to get this part. So I need him to focus on that. I need him to watch other people being very good. But at one point in the rehearsal, Langham, who knew everything about how he wanted to shape our movement, how many steps it took to get to here, to lift this, to say to that, to do it. It was manicure, you know, manicure, manicured and not manufactured, but he had a shape that he insisted that we fill. And that we learn why we were doing that. Why was that so elegant? Why did that work? Why did the girls need to go out and practice sitting on tumpties? Because that's what they were wearing, and this is elegant, and that meant something, and it, it conveyed something. It meant everything to Michael, to be precise, to be elegant, to be clear, to be articulate, and all that stuff. So he was pretty determined to tell us what to do. And one day I defied him, and I said, I don't know where I got the balls to do it, but I said, um, uh, no, Michael, no, I think, I think you're wrong. Because he, he was a terrible actor. So he'd do something and he'd just laugh, his acting was so bad. But I think he did that on purpose. But he asked me to do something and I said, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I think you're wrong. And he looked at me funny and he said, well, what do you think it should be? I said, well, I, 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 I think it should be this, this, and this. And he went, do that, now, and, and so I did. And upon reflection, because I went away having, you know, thinking, I've engaged with the master. We've spoken as, as, as equals. I, I, I collaborated with him. I didn't just <laughs> take notes or direction. We, we spoke, we had an exchange. And I'm convinced now, in retrospect, that it was utter bullshit. It was management skill at its finest. He thought, what does it cost me to let this kid think he's had a good idea? I'll change it next week. We'll figure it out. But right now, he needs to express something. And I got five minutes I can watch. But it really helped. And so then what happened was Hirsch decided he was going to do R&J the next year. And he said, I don't have anybody. And why did you choose to do R&J then? Well, uh, maybe Shauna could do it, McKenna, and, and what about Colin? And Michael said, no. No, not at all. He's nowhere near ready to begin to think of, of doing that. He's, no, 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 and again I say no. And Hirsch said, really, I, I need him to. Well, he's not, he's not done. I take no responsibility, you know. No, How no. do you know this conversation happened? Because they spoke of it. And, you know, so then I was, I was offered it and, and a bunch of other things. And I thought, well, I, I admire and, and respect and adore Michael and everything that he's doing for me. But this is an opportunity as, a, you know, I was a kid still. I mean, I'm barely 25. I might have been 24. Um, I thought, hair's falling out. It's not going to come again. I'm, I'm no Romeo anyway. They're just, it's come up in the schedule as organically these things do, and they need to do it now. So if I don't take advantage of this, I'm, I'm never going to get another chance. And so I did it. And I mean, I learned an immense amount. And I believe I was doing another Love's Labor's Lost with Michael, you know, stepping up, doing Longaville this time. And so there were still chance to, to polish and to practice while taking on the heroic responsibility of Romeo. I imagine that the banishment speech of Romeo, which has defeated most young Romeos, I imagine that you did that really, really well. Given your technique, your ability, your long form and your skills, that speech kills most Romeos. You go, yeah. shut up. Yeah, no, but you have to, I, I threw myself at it thinking, look, Again, going back to that Claudio moment and going back to figuring out who I was becoming as a person. Was Donna on the scene yet? No, no, miles away, miles away. But I was apprehending without comprehending one of Michael's best phrases. 
apprehension without comprehension. You're studying to know, you're learning, you, just, you haven't quite, you know, comprehended a thing, so you're still talking about it. So if Hamlet had been satisfied ever with what he was thinking, he'd shut up, but he's not. So he keeps searching for comprehension, and you're just always on the edge. I was beginning to see or to feel what I might be good at, and it struck me that my you know, wild Irish Catholic, you know, Celtic temperament jived with a certain emotionality. I mean, I was, I'm still preternaturally shy, but I thought that emotionally there's probably something dark and howling that I get, and that maybe I can connect to that. So, you know, romantic and elegant and all that, I have no fucking clue, but, but howling at the moon with dark, somber, wind-swept gray shores, mm. Celtic's mystic, you know, banshee spirit. And who directed that? No, it was directed by Peter Dews. But Peter Dews, right. you see now, Peter Dews, who was losing it at that point, I didn't realize this, did it with the, his face in the book and his North Country accent. It was actually from exactly the same town as Brian Bedford. And he and Brian Bedford spoke in exactly the same way, like Mr. Elliot, don't you know? That's how Brian talked until he got all polished and, you know, London-like. And he sat in the book and said, not in my production, you don't. And occasionally we'd try to be funny. And he'd say, well, that's about as funny as baby's open grave. And you think, okay, nice image. I guess we won't be doing that. But I adored him because he had directed The Shrew when me and Carrie and Shari Flett had done it in 1981. So I knew him. And I felt comfortable with him. And I knew that Romeo, I'd be spending most of my uh, days and my nights with my ass to the audience. So instead of polishing my interpretation, I would have my tights tightened weekly. I'm not kidding, because they were made of wool and they'd stretch. Sean Austin Olsen looked like he'd <laughs> his pants. And he was playing uh, Tybalt. 